So we're going to be doing part two of the early medieval period across um, a small number of sites. Now we step over to the water to Somerset and we look at the site briefly at Dinner's Palace and we look at Landock briefly. We look at um, Cadbury Hill Castle uh, because there's several Cadbury Castles if you look um, around that region. We're going to look at um, Glastonbury Tour as well and uh, we're going to chuck in Killian. Now this um, this is meant to be a homage to King Arthur but at the same time I've got to try and be very professional and, and put across the evidence for a period that King Arthur lived. So um, I've mentioned him twice now so I've got to try and reduce, I, this is meant to be trying to do a talk about this period without mentioning a guy too much which I've already failed. I just wanted to mention that um, next week we're going to be going back to European archaeology as, as, as we've been doing. Um, and I just wanted to, before I really get into my flow, before I really forget, we're going to be looking at the Kyrenian ship bur ship, uh, shipwreck. I was going to say Kyrenian ship, ship uh, burial, so, um, which was um, sunk off the um, Kyrenian coast in northern Cyprus. Um, and it was excavated in the late 1960s, 1970s. So that's, that's what we're going to look at next week. So <coughs> one, one, one thing that one place that you're going to be all aware of is is um, is Dinis Powers. Some of you will be aware of this site, which is one of the uh, banks and ditches at um, Dinis Powers um, apostrophes hill fort. It's um, it's a site that runs from um, the depths of the Iron Age, all the way into the Roman period, all the way into the depths of the Dark Ages, the early medieval period, the uh, period of King Arthur, which completely conflicts um, the following statement, the Dark Ages, the period of illumination, the period of early Christianity, the post-Roman period. There's all these different names given to that time. Now, I want to interject straight away there you know i i've not started promoting my new book at, at all really because we, we we wanted to get the books in our hands um and we've already sold 25 copies and um you know um that's good but we haven't promoted it yet but on, on the archaeology Cymru facebook I, I put a thing saying you know we've got the book coming out use the cover mm -hmm. for people involved in archaeology Cymru, anyone interested and this guy comes on um, he's an Arthurian guy. He's called uh, Ross uh, Broderstock, right? He's got his own YouTube channel and all the rest of it. And he'll probably be watching this video when it goes out anyway. Anyway, um, he, he, cri he criticises me highly for the title of the book, Romans in South Wales. And I'm saying, if you actually read the book, you'll see me quoted as saying um, that only 1% of the population of South Wales was, was ever classed as Roman. 99% of the people in South Wales were influenced by the Romans or they influenced the Romans. He said that's not good enough. Um, you, you should call it the, um, uh, the um, Cumro in Cymru, which is fine. But then we lose the context. The context is it's the Roman period. Yeah, so it's, the, it's a period that we classify as the Roman period. No matter who lived in it, it's the Roman period. And one thing that we've got to be really specific about is the period after Rome, Roman administration and the idea of Roman feeling that your Roman started to collapse into the middle part of the 400s. And then we've got to give a name to that period all the way up to when the Normans start to come into our domain. Right. And to be honest with you, there's no real fixed idea. There should. It's not the Dark Ages. When you say early medieval period, you actually think, oh, the medieval period began in 1066, didn't it? No, it's the early part of the medieval period we're talking about. So whenever you do a subject like this, it's very confusing. So um, I put all the confusing stuff in there now and I'm going to try and make it a little bit easier for us to try to comprehend. Now, one of the things that's, that makes it easier to comprehend is that there's a lot of this early medieval evidence, this period from the 400s all the way to about um, 1090s when the Normans start to come into in the area. There's a lot of evidence. But what we were told at school was that there wasn't much evidence when in fact the same teachers were telling us about the Vikings and they were telling us about the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles and they were telling us about the Jutes and the Angles and all these other things. 
So the teachers in our schools were contra contradicting themselves. So, so what, 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 what I'm going to do is just have a sniff. Let's have a bit of a sniff at this site. We've been there. Uh, this bank and ditch was created in the period that we're talking about. It was not this bank. This bank and a ditch was not created in the Iron Age. It was created um, in this post-Roman era. So, I, I just thought I just sort of thought of looking at this site. Let's just gently go through the images. It's Cadbury Hill, right? And then there it is again. There it is. And then we look at Dennis Powers, and then we go to Killian. All of these sites have something very much in common. They, they have that air of a period that we are still to learn a great deal about. We've started to understand this site of Dennis Powers. Yeah, this site was excavated by Leslie Alcock from the um, 1954 um, to about 1958. And he did a, a landmark report in the 1960s. Um, and Leslie Alcock um, challenged what other archaeologists were saying. Um, and this is one thing that I do. Um, I challenge, I challenge um, issues to do with um, dating and, and history and, and, and so on. This is why we do these talks. He said, no, this bank in a ditch is, is not Iron Age. And they said, of course it's Iron Age. It's not Iron Age. Of course it's Iron Age. All right, I'll prove it's not Iron Age. When he dug there, the archaeological evidence was telling him that this was being built in the 400s AD not 400 years BC, so he challenged it. Okay, you're wrong. Use the archaeological evidence, use the pottery. Oh, you're wrong. Okay, use the radiocarbon dating evidence. Oh, the radiocarbon dating evidence isn't right. So, it, it, you know, trying to convince people of things is really difficult in archaeology. Now, this is looking out of, of, of the Somerset levels. This is actually from Cadbury, um, Cadbury Hill Castle. Um, sometimes referred to as Cadbury Castle, but there's another Cadbury um, Castle elsewhere. There's several Cadbury Castles. This is the one on the Somerset levels. Um, and this is tight knit related to the evidence that we associate, for example, with Glastonbury. Now, what we do find at Cadbury Castle is some of that pottery, some of that amphora, some of the other evidence as a as a little intro at these some of these other sites that we're talking about now why is this evidence here at this this is actually a proper hill fort this hill fort was built in the iron age but the evidence actually on this site is also later so the banks and ditches most of them might be iron age that's fine right it's very different from dinner's powers right but this site itself um this enigmatic site is is in that sort of myths and legends echo that we actually get from Glastonbury. Um, I've been to this site and there's a there's a weird there's a weird sense when you go there, um, and it, it's it's a bit like Glastonbury without the shops, without the tourists, and without the people banging bells or blowing or, or, drawing, or blowing bugles. If you go with me, so what we do know is it it was it was thought that. Um, because of the evidence being found here that this site is closely linked to Glastonbury because of the pottery, the similar pottery being found at Glastonbury, again from this period into the four 500s. And they started to believe that this site, and then you link it with Dinis Powys, um, Dinis being city or place of a leader, or that's one translation. Um, I know Kathy's shouting at the screen, but the fact of the matter is we believe that these localities are being reused, replenished with this new period. Um, and then you get the ideas of Bearhead, King Arthur. This is, and, and you start to think that what's happening is people are going back to their old ways. Right. So um, what's, you know, for example, we, we were brought up um drinking um drinking milk and then we go off it um in our teenagers and then we start to go back to drinking milk right that type of metaphor right so this is what's happening we go back to what we're familiar with and and this is what's happening people people in this period of breakdown um period of change don't use the word breakdown too much um change the period of change because you're going into the 400s you're talk you're talking into 420s 430s um the idea of rome is starting to fade other ideas are coming over here the the, the ideas of the anglo-saxons people from ireland a, a new revived christianity 
the old ways of Rome are still calling you. And then you start, and, and then there's lots of internal threats, external threats, various other things going on. Um, and what I'm trying to say is, is there's, there's lots of insecurity, there's, there's lots of change. And, and, and Jane demonstrated it earlier on. Um, you know, she's so pleased to have the COVID um, vaccine. Um, and maybe that Jane could feel that she could go back to as it was a year ago. Um, and it's, it's, it's a crutch. It, 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 it's a way of feeling comfortable. When we talk about this period into the 400s, people feel comfortable in the old ways before Rome because it's easier to cope. You don't need to maintain roads and build walls and all these other things that go bump in the night. So, again, if you ever do get an opportunity to go to the likes of um, Glastonbury, give, give, give Cadbury Hill Castle um, a visit. Because what you do get when you go to Cadbury Hill Castle is everything that Glastonbury should be. Um, and what I mean by that, when you go to the top of the tour at Glastonbury, you get a feeling of, oh wow, there's a massive positive sense, right? There's a massive positive sense um, at the likes of um, Glastonbury. But when you look around, you've got houses and you've got the town and then you've got the gift shops and all these other things. Um, and all this sense of modernness. But when you go to Cadbury Hill Castle, there's lots of really interesting senses of what the past may have been like, not just in the Iron Age, but what the past and the landscape could have actually been like, um, for example, in this period that we're talking about, the four or the 500s. So, so it's a really powerful place to go to. If you look at the subtext with Glastonbury, as we will look at, um, it's not just about King Arthur. It's not just about um, ley lines and crystals and shops, which which I really love. You know, I, I love all that type of stuff. But also, I've got to be very scientific. I'm meant to be. I'm meant to try and put this aurora across. I'm a scientific archaeologist. I, I I need to have facts, um, and there are facts with these localities. But it's just trying to sort them out from all the um, in brackets dross. So again, Cadbury Hill, and if you go a bit further on in the map, you, you, you've got the lights, likes of... Um, oh, I've got to have to turn the sound off on this one because it's doing my head in. And anyone else who's got their mobile phones in, because I know somebody else's phone just rang, try and, um, try and switch it off for me, please. Um, so what we've got, we've got Cadbury Hill. Um, the, the tour is actually um, further inland. And what, what then, then you do find um, is, is, is that you've got this, this rich site that then paints a similar picture of evidence to um, uh, Glastonbury Tor. Um, and as we start to say, um, again, banks and ditches, this sort of sense, this, this sense of picturesqueness. We're going away from Cadbury now. Um, and then we can then link that type of site with the, like the type of site that Dennis Power. So, so this, is, this is all, what I'm trying to do is link everything together. And the common link is not King Arthur. The common link is that actually people are living at these sites and reusing these sites um, at this time into the four, into the 500s, into this period that I would say of illumination, not the Dark Ages. They have been undertaking new excavations um, at um, Dinis Paris over the last decade, trying to prove the, trying to give more meat on the bones of the archaeological excavation that was actually carried out by uh, Leslie Olcock um, in the 1950s. So now we go to this next site. How many of you have actually been to this wonderful site at Killian? I have. Eight. Yeah, a couple of times. Yeah. Right. Yeah, good. It was my first school trip. <laughs> yeah. And that was Goth's first school trip as well. Yeah. Was it? All right, fair enough. That's good. Oh, Goth, if, if, uh, if this was your first school trip, Goth, can you remember there used to be a little uh, hut off the car park that used to go into this field? Um, and it used to be like a ticket office and they used to sell booklets in there. And alongside that were about three or four stone sarcophagi. Can you remember that? No, because I was larking about when I was 11. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, you were larking about, larking about, like, you know, larking. Right, that's a bit of a shame because um, it's something, I don't know what happened to these sarcophagi. I think one or two of them are in that, actually the museum. Oh, and uh, just just a little bit of announcement, <coughs> which which I'm so proud of as well. Um, uh, we might be uh, working with the National Museum of Wales on a project soon. 
Um, and also, if you go to the Legionary Museum, guess whose booking we'll find on sale there. Thank you very much. So, now this site itself... Price um, £14. Pounds. Yeah. No, 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 no. no. Find a copy. No, 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 listen, right, the reason why it's £14 is because I'm having to send it out in a post-tune dumpty. It'll be remaindered then for well, five wait hours. for the reduction, the discount version. What, the, the, the signed version? All right, then that's fine. <laughs> oh, no, that means that Arnold has to pay less for the... Oh, no, 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 you've got to pay more for a signed version. Did you see that? I... I you know, sorry. Right, anyway, back to the lecture. See, we got completely distracted then. Completely. So, when you go to the amphitheatre, there, there's a few things that I've I, I've realised about the amphitheatre, right? Um, and I've never realised this before, ever. I've been to Cullion many times. Um, 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 the place of the lion, Cullion. Um, and bas basically, uh, when... Whenever I thought about this site, I thought, wow, it is built by the legionaries. Um, and, you know, the legionaries used it. Um, and then when the legionaries moved away to uh, be rebuilt at Hadrian's Wall um, in about the 120s to the 130s, the amphitheatre was no longer used. Um, and the walls were not repaired around the legionary base and the civilian vicus grew up and the civilians moved in to the to the Roman fortress at Achillean and that's that's usually the tagline I'm given right and and but there's one problem with this the best set of remains in Achillean are actually the amphitheatre so something about what I've said and practically all of what I've said is probably wrong um, now and the reason why I'm making such a fuss about the amphitheatre um, is is an unusual point that people never think about. And and the point is, if you're building a legionary fortress, why would you build an amphitheatre directly outside the fortress, where the amphitheatre overlooks the defences into the fortress? Right, so if anyone was attacking the legionary fortress, the easiest thing to take would have been the amphitheatre. And as soon as you captured the amphitheatre, you'd be able to see into the fortress. You'd be able to check, chuck projectiles in, you'd be able to see the uh, movements of the Roman army inside the fortress. And you start to ask the question, I'm probably one of the only people to ask the question, I do not believe that the amphitheatre was actually built by the Roman legion uh, based at Chalian. I actually believe that the amphitheatre was built after the Roman legion actually moved out of Chalian. Um And I'm saying that because the, the amphitheatre where it is doesn't make sense. Then I have somebody took, looking at me saying, oh, lo lots of Roman military sites had amphitheatres associated with them. And then, you, then I say, well, if you look at the amphitheatre in London, which wasn't a Roman military base, um, there was a little fort there, but not actually, you know, the, the city at London, Londinium. The amphitheatre is actually in the middle um, of, of the city itself. And I start to ask severe questions about the dating of this amphitheatre. Um, and then, then, I, then I start to think, I start to think the other question that I ask myself, why is the amphitheatre the, the best surviving amphitheatre um, left anywhere in Britain? Why, why are the remains of the amphitheatre some of the best remains of a Roman um, site in Britain? Well, I know it's probably in the top 100, but, you know, there, there are thousands of Roman sites in Britain. So there you go. So and, and then I start to think if it's so well preserved, it must have been used into the 200s. It must have been used into the 200s all the way to the end that Roman civilization starts to pitter out into the 400s, 420s, 430s, 440s. And then I ask the key question. If this is if this building has survived all these years, could this building have actually been used into the four, five, six, seven, eight hundreds? And the answer is probably yes. But we're basing that on evidence elsewhere. Um, and what we do see is amphitheatres at other sites um, are being used into the four, five hundreds. You know, people, people are building houses within them and all sorts of other things. And when you think about it, the amphi this amphitheatre, if we, if we look at it from above, look how defendable that site is. If you block up all the entranceways, 
and maybe keep one or two open, right? And you could defend this site. And guess what? One, two, three, four, five, six of these entrance ways were actually blocked up. So, you know, that one in particular was completely blocked up because there's a shrine in it, right? This one was blocked up as well. This one was partly blocked up. So when, when, you, when you start to look at the archaeology of this site, it tells us a different story. Now, oh, over, over the years, I, I've, I've very much started to, to think outside the box. And you've had to think outside the box because I tell you what, the amphitheatre sounds very boring when you think about Roman soldiers wandering around um, in some kind of competitive sense. Uh, but when you start to think about the amphitheatre in another light and the other uses, the people, the people of Kalian, right, must have used this site for a very long time after the Roman military had long since gone. This site itself is far better preserved than the amphitheatre that was constructed in, in connection with Colchester. In fact, the amphitheatre in Colchester was demolished in the Roman period to use the building material elsewhere. This was not demolished to use the building material elsewhere. So this is telling us something. But there's a sadness. The sadness is the opportunity was missed by the, by the great archaeologist Sir Mortimer Wheeler in the 1920s. Now, I've got a nice bit of text that we're going to look at, right? I'm going to just, I'm just going to sort of go over this text quite briefly. Agree with it or disagree with it. It's a nice little bit of text. Um, so, so again, what we've got is a reconstruction. Uh, but the reconstruction isn't too far away from how the site would have actually looked. Because if you think about it, all this lower stonework is more or less still intact. Yeah. Um, and interestingly enough, over there, if anyone's ever been to Killian with me, I do a beeline to what that is. And do you know what that is? It's actually the complete remains of an arch. A Roman arch. Now, that's really, really interesting. Hang on a minute. Let's just, let's just rewind a bit, right? As that's the remains of a Roman arch over here, why hasn't it been reconstructed? Well, they run out of money to reconstruct the arch in the 1920s, right? That, that's the first thing, right? That arch itself would have been the first thing to go. And therefore, it would have been the first thing to be salvaged for building work elsewhere. They didn't, use, they didn't take that stonework. It was left there. So that indicates this site was used for an incredible length of time. And why haven't I got the evidence? Because the evidence... The archaeological evidence was was lost to us. Now, I, I I believe, I believe that the that the story that I'm just about to unfold disagree with it. But what what I want what I want to do from the little bit of a text, um, what I want to do is actually say, well, you know, we can actually prove or disprove what I'm just about to read out. If we actually excavated, and I'll show you where you need to excavate. If there was an opportunity to excavate this little bit there because this little bit here might still contain some of the archaeological evidence we need to try and see if this site continued in use into the 200s which it did into the 300s which it undoubtedly did did it actually remain in use into the 400s that's the question i really want answered that's the question which will tell us about this dark age period and therefore, it's not going to be Dark Ages for too much longer. I can never understand why the word Dark Ages is used. Because, again, in one moment, the historians tell us that um, uh, that we don't know much about this period. But at the same time, we've got all this documentary evidence. And we've got wonderful sites like Glastonbury, Tintagel. Um, we, we, we've got lots of other evidence spread across the country. We've got coin evidence and all the rest of it. So it can't be a Dark Age period. Now, this itself is, I, I could have shown you loads of views, and I know I've, I, I've touched upon this before, and sorry if I'm recapping, but I'm, I'm trying to make more of an impact with, with what we're looking at. So, excavations, there were excavations in um, 1926, 1927. Um, within a, basically the, the, the case of a year, they managed to clear most of the site. 
they, they took it off. This is actually um, a railway system, a, a light railway. And do you know what? These railway tracks, uh, they, they, the re they, they, this is a narrow gauge railway that I do believe was part of the, the narrow gauge railway laid by, um, by Wilhelm's army in the First World War. Um, and what, what they did, they, there was all this, this railway that had been um, laid by the Germans in the First World War. And they lifted it all up, put it onto boats, brought it over here um, as war reparations. Right. Um, and I do believe that that's part of the stockpile. And then they used it to lay a railway system in here um, to actually excavate the site. So you're talking about hundreds of thousands of tons of material removed and very little of the soil was ever examined. Lost opportunity. Lost opportunity to change the course of the history of, of, of Britain, let alone Cymru, Wales. But the, the, whole, the whole understanding of history could have changed on that moment. But it was a lost opportunity. Now, Sir Mortimer Wheeler was an extremely talented, extremely knowledgeable, um, excellent archaeologist. Except this is in the 1950s when he wanted to make his name in archaeology. And unfortunately, he made his name in archaeology on the wrong site. It, uh, what he wanted to do was he wanted to get to the Roman remains. He wanted to get there. So here we go. I'll just quickly scan through this and I'll pick out what I want. Killian's Roman Amphitheatre um, has been known as the site of King Arthur's court since the 1100s. But there is... But is there any evidence to prove this was the case? There could have been. But are we wanting to prove this is to do with King Arthur? No. I want to. I want to. I want to see if people are living in Kalean in the four five hundreds, and if it's got anything to do with King Arthur, then that's fine. That's okay. That's all right. We'll we'll, we'll leave it for the historians. I'm an archaeologist. In AD 4, 1405, the French army, which had landed at Milford Avon to support Owen Glendur and his uprising against the English crown, reached Killian in South Wales. Here they visited King Arthur's Round Table. Now, this is interesting. By the 1400s, Killian, the amphitheatre, was thought to be the Round Table of King Arthur. It's definitely a round table. It's a round table of the early medieval period, whatever words you want to put towards it. According to a French source, the French visited the round table of Arthurian legend. The round table was, in fact, the Roman amphitheatre of the uh, legionary fortress at Isca. Um, now, I've mentioned this guy, Geoffrey of Monmouth, that identified Killian as the court of King Arthur in his fictional epic. But he didn't name the amphitheatre as such as being the round table. But he mentioned that the court... Of King Arthur was held at Killian in his history of um, the kings of Britain in 1136. This identification close to the area of his upbringing has been described as a fruits of lively historical imagination playing upon the visible remains of an imposing Roman city. Some of Roman Isca's remains were still standing to full height into the 1200s. We've actually got whole descriptions of the Roman bath house within the centre of Killian, still standing with its vaulted height um, into the 1200s, only to be de demolished by an, an, a Norman um, invader uh, that uh, demolished the Roman site to be used into a castle that he was building there. Um, what we then have is other writers such as David Ap Gwilym, Gwilym and Chrétien de Troyes and others um, um, talking about King Arthur's court, um, court and sealing this identification as maybe being at Killian. Geoffrey of Monmouth did not actually mention Arthur's round table as such being the amphitheatre but actually Killian being the court of King Arthur. It was only um, a translation into French of, of Geoffrey of Monmouth's work by Wace of Jersey in about 1155 <coughs> that Weiss of Jersey mentioned the round table as being at Cleon, as being possibly the amphitheatre. And that going into the fables of the history and the understanding of the oral tradition associated with those that actually came over in 14... The date is actually 1404, not 1405, that the French helped, helped um, Owen Glendur. Um, um, but you can imagine um, doing... It, it, it's going along the old Roman road... Um, 
um, and heading towards um, Killian and then heading up towards um, Gloucestershire to the site of Woodbury and all, and all the rest of it. Everything else goes into history. Them doing a detour. I, I like that little bit of information. But they're doing a detail, detour because our country is so steeped in, in, in wonderful history that, that we are only starting to scratch the surface even still. When the Killian Excavation Committee was set up in 1926, the director of the National Museum of Wales, Sir Mortimer Wheeler, only um, um, uh, Mortimer Wheeler at that uh, point, Brigadier General uh, Mortimer Wheeler, um, who lived between 1890 and 1976, made the most of the connection between the amphitheatre and the Arthur's Round Table, as this was likely to attract considerable funds required for a long-term programme of work. But this, this is the sad thing. He, he basically linked in, in public media that this was the site of King Arthur's Round Table, right? But he didn't actually do the work to find King Arthur's Round Table or any link to do with this early medieval Dark Age period. He, all he wanted to do was to excavate the amphitheater. Now, we've got to be, we've got to be very careful in archaeology and we've got to be very careful with what I'm about to say now. If somebody said there's King Arthur's Round Table over there, would I be looking for King Arthur's Round Table? I would not. I would be looking for the archaeology. And if that person wants to do the link between King Arthur's Round Table, then you're welcome to it. All I'm doing is, is presenting the information. Roman, early medieval, Norman. And then you can make as you will of it. I'm fine. I'm okay with that. One thing I used to say, that... that that came across quite well that bit. Uh, one one thing I always say is that the archaeologist uh, the archaeologist gives you the information, and then the historian and you guys interpret. <coughs> That's fine. That's what we're here for. Um, Sir Mortimer Wheeler announced his project to the press, and soon the Daily Mail had signed an agreement to provide one thousand pounds for exclusive rights and daily reports on the uncovering of King Arthur's Round Table. In the end, their offer was trebled three thousand pounds, and the newspaper carried regular sensational reports. Wheeler was accused of shameless exploitation, but his strategy had produced the much-needed funding in the excavation of the amphitheatre. Now, okay, right. Let's just step back a bit and get off my high horse. If it wasn't for Sir Mortimer Wheeler doing that back then, the amphitheatre would never have been excavated. It would be like the a Roman amphitheatre at Dorchester, which hasn't been excavated at all. It's just a big pudding donut type thing in the middle of two roads that goes through Dorchester, um, which is near Maiden Castle, not been excavated. Right? We lost most of the amphitheatre in London because um, that what was left was excavated in the 1980s. We've lost a big chunk, chunk of the amphitheatre at Chester, but a big chunk of it is on display. Maybe if this um, work hadn't been undertaken, um, we would not be seeing what we're seeing today. So I've got to step back and say, okay, in a way he did the right thing, but people who want to learn more, he didn't. Wheeler's excavations focused on the Roman archaeology. Damn you, man. But uh, obviously, we've got the amphitheatre, so he did what he felt was right. And no early medieval remains were reported. What a loss. Wouldn't it have been great to have linked this archaeological evidence with other sites? To basically say, actually, you know, it's not a free-for-all. You know, the world doesn't go to pot in the 400s, 420s, 430s. Things still going on, right? But then again, this is archaeology all over. This is how archaeology has been conducted for many, many years. Um, and the problem is in the nineteen, in the nineteen twenties and before, people were interested in um, prehistoric sites. Then they were interested in Roman sites. Then they're back interested in prehistoric sites. Well, they're bulldozing the South Wales valleys and all our industrial buildings. The archaeologists are off looking at prehistoric archaeology right and then we lose that information that is now long gone do you know do you know people um people live in the south wales valleys now and they don't know it's a valley which actually had a mining industry because there's nothing around to say that the mining industry ever happened so th this this connection with the past needs to be up upheld to give us a picture of the past when you go to sicily it's everywhere um, you, you, you just you just step over it, which was a great a great presentation to do. Um, and we've got to learn from that. We've actually got to say, let's stop. 
let's present you with more information. Um, however, one little thing that some of you have already read, however, a tantalizing glimpse of possible activity within the area during the early medieval period is provided by one single copper alloy find from the excavations. One single artifact that's dated from the five and the six hundreds, a brooch pin. This may have been an isolated loss, but the recent discovery of early medieval timber buildings within the Roman amphitheatre beneath the Guildhall in the City of London indicate that such sites were sometimes reoccupied at a later date. That's what I'm saying about Killian. It's exactly what I'm saying. But the evidence is gone. Could the Killian amphitheatre have been reused in the early medieval period? This is almost as if I've writ written this now. No convincing evidence was ever reported and we are left to speculate on the original context of the brooch pin but we could possibly get that context if a little archaeological excavation was undertaken at the location that I've mentioned. So you've got this wonderful brooch pin here um, and that's all we've got which is a massive shame but we've got some evidence. What pottery could there have been? What of all these other wonderful gems of information that we get from Cadbury Hill? What happened to all that? What, do you know what I'd love to do is find the spoil heap which I'm sure would be quite a high spoil heap. I'm told it was used for railway embankments um, but if, there, if we know where one of the spoil heaps is from this excavation I would love to sieve every single gram of soil and then we might get the evidence that we actually need. So, whoa, I'm um, non-stop talking. You should have interrupted me, um, Chris, with some gem of wisdom. <laughs> now, one thing I want to do is 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 just give you my my take on something. Um, it is three sites in one. You all know where Landock Hospital is, and um, and this is just up the road at a place called St. Doctoy's Church. And I've got something in the chat box. Oh yeah, Jessica's saying, I, I, I've done a, a, a small video on this cross. Yes, you have, Jessica. Um, and that's on YouTube. Um, Jessica went there recently and she did a little video. But this, this cross itself, for me, tells us a lot more about this period um, than most other sites. And what this tells us is an, another way archaeologists have got things wrong. So let's sort of tune in on this, and it's really difficult to get good images of this. If you look at this, the base, and they've got a clearer, clearer image coming up, is in a very different style than the shaft. And this shaft is very different from this plinth. And this style of carving is very different from uh, the, the, the top of this shaft. An archaeologist used to say that there was a wheel cross on the top of this. And I'm thinking, where are they getting that from? And then other archaeologists do realise, like me, that that was, no, that was not there originally. All of these bits have been collected from around the church graveyard and stuck together. So where have they been stuck together from? Who would have had the money to create something like this in this period, into the four, five, six hundreds? Who would have had the money? Well, actually, these people had the money. They excavated a cemetery just north of um, St. Doc Doy's church in 1994. And this itself, the base of this cross, I do believe might be associated with a Roman villa that was excavated in the 19, um, late 1970s, 1977 to 1979. This Roman villa um, had a Roman hypercore system. Uh, it had the remains of a mosaic. Um, there were burials on site. Um, it had a collard, a, a collard, which is more or less unique in Roman Britain, a collard um, wooden piping system. These are actually iron collars for the Roman villa, which is by the church. Um, and it was the best, to me, the best Roman villa ever found in Wales. And unfortunately, um, the planners at the time tossed a coin. Um, and, and, they, and they tossed a coin that could have meant that this site is to be saved from development, or a site in Barry is to be saved from development. The site in Barry won. 
And that is the Glanamore site in Barry, another Roman site. But because more councillors voted in Barry to save the Barry site, this site was lost forever. And it's a shame because they rushed the excavation work at this site. Um, and it was nobody's fault. They had to do the work. In fact, this was actually found in the last two hours of the excavation before the bulldozers moved on site. Story has it that an archaeologist was wandering across the site and he saw a brown stain in the ground and decided to put his trowel into the ground and he touched a bit of metal and then he realised there was a bit of piping across the site. Um, so the wooden piping is now gone. So, again, another lost opportunity to understand early medieval within our own landscape complete lost opportunity and again this this is this is um without mentioning what today is about um that that's one reason why i've wanted to put heritage on the agenda because i want to stop these types of things happening because the information that we're losing is key to our understanding of of of, of everything that that makes our country and, and where it's at in the annals of time so I, I do believe that this itself is actually from um, a, the the later stage of the Roman villa but I'll never be able to prove it because the carving itself is of more or less that period a strange type of period when they're when they're experimenting with with new forms of carving um, and then what we then have is this very crude side on look at a, a shaft that's very crude indeed so maybe looking at, at that into the 500s no idea of this date i believe that this could actually come from the roman villa as well but it's been re recarved and this is a more advanced form of carving probably from the seven eight hundreds so whatever this is is being put together by somebody thinking that they think it looks like this um and I'll, I'll mention it again. I don't know if any of you are massive fans of Star Trek, but there was um, in in the in the first series of of Star Trek, Captain Kirk visited a planet, um, and um, a crewmate from a previous expedition had, land, had crash landed onto the planet. And these aliens tried to put human beings together, and they put the human beings together wrong. They, they reconstructed human beings together wrong because they didn't know what a human being looked like and they got all the limbs together and they got it wrong. That's what the episode is about. And that's what I believe the metaphor is this. They, they, in, for this period, because we're trying to make it up and put it together, we're not doing a good job and we're getting things wrong. And the other thing as well is this is one of the finest carvings ever found in Wales and it's still outside in a church graveyard open to the, the elements. Um, and the possibility that this could be destroyed by um, anybody um, that feels that these things are not important. And the context of that carving and the Roman villa and the building and the church and everything that we know about Landoc. Landoc is a massively important period. Um, uh, start again. Landoc is massively important to this period that we're talking about, this early medieval period. Now, interestingly enough... I had heard about this site and um, on the grapevine, I had heard that the archaeologists, the Camogne and Gwent Archaeological Trust, said that there was nothing north of the church. So when the building developer got onto site, they thought, brilliant, we're gonna, um, it was an ideal homes um, site. They, 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 they were building um, um, a new housing estate there and uh, they, they, they were, uh, they were thinking, right, we just get the houses in and that's how it's going to be. We don't need the archaeologists because we're told there's nothing here. Right. And then the first digger that, that scooped into the ground, skulls rolled out of the trench. Uh, and the, um, the, the the manager on the site, he said, oh, don't tell anyone about this. Right. So he took the skulls to use them as weights um, on his site caravan. He, he, he used them as paperweights. I'm not making this up. Right. And then somebody turned up, and um, um, somebody from the local media had heard something, and he turned up in his office, and he said, um, "You've got human skulls on your desk." Oh yeah, but it's. Um, and then it turned out that he actually had a human skull under his bed at home. They had to bring the police in as well. It was all sorts of weird things. They mm. eventually found out that there was over a thousand sets of human remains found at this site, and there was actually um, a, an, an area of cremations. 
that in 1994, Cotswold archaeology undertook an archaeological excavation adjacent to the church of St. Docklois Church at Landoc near Cardiff. It was quickly realised that a major cemetery had been found, an excavation over an area of just, um, just under an acre revealed 1,026 burials, including cremations. What they found, there was um, um, just a bit further up north from that lady excavating there, um, who's actually a member of Archaeology Cymru. Um, she's excavating near an area where there was um, a an area of cremations, and in the middle of that cremations were the cremations of children. Um, so that would mean that those cremations of children were probably sometime in about the 300s. And then by the later 300s into the 400s, they're actually burying people. And look at that there. This information is, this information is massive. Um, and, and the report about this site is wonderful as well. So it was quickly realised that a major cemetery had been found. The present church of St. Dr. Oz largely dates from about the 1800s. Uh, but it's long been considered to overlie the site of one of the major early medieval monasteries of Gamorgan. One of the one of the one of the richest rich, richest areas of early medieval archaeology anywhere in Wales. Right, you know, talking is the four five hundreds. So if you if you want to talk if you want to talk about King Arthur and all that type of stuff, go to a site like this because the archaeology tells you that there is stuff going on in this landscape. There you go, the burials there, we've got the Roman villa there, it mentions the Roman villa. The earliest radiocarbon dates from the human remains show that burial had commenced by the period between the 370s and the 640s um, CE AD. So in other words, the earliest remains on the site, and obviously the cremations as well, it's not mentioning that, the burials are talking about um, um, in, inhumations, burials, and it's not putting the cremations into that. Um, and um, so so what, what we then got is that... Um, we, the next line will go on to that that lady in the front is actually barbara barbara bags um from cardiff and um she was involved in the excavations and i'll tell you another little bit of a story right um this this is this is how cavalier i am my my mum was in hospital at the time she she with a uh, with a serious bout of cancer um at landock hospital and my and, and um and i went in to see my mum and uh and she said, oh, are you, are you staying? And I said, no, I, I, I've got to go and see the excavation down the road. And she said, oh, what's that to do with it? And I, I said, oh, they're excavating human remains. Um, and she wasn't impressed that I was putting the archaeology before her. But I'm sure she understood because it was a wonderful opportunity to see an excavation. The presence of sherds of imported amphora from five graves provides evidence of late 400s to 500s activity of some nature at Landock. So the amphora that they're finding is the same type of amphora evidence that we're finding at Tintagel, the same type of evidence that we're actually finding at Dinis Powers, the same type of evidence that we're finding at Glastonbury, Cadbury Castle, you name it, there's a lot going on. It's all linked. So at this time, people were trading from the continent to all these localities. It must have been like... Um, you know when a Tesco's lorry goes around all its stores? Um, so you've got a boat coming from the continent and it's got it's going into Tintagel and it's just floating up the coastline. Eventually gets to sites that we don't even know where they are. Then it eventually it gets to... it could a, a, a vessel could get all the way down up to Glastonbury Tor because it was all up in high water level in the winter. You could get all the way to the base of Glastonbury Tor on the boat. Right, actually, you could... In my new book... Romans in South Wales. Um, a copy is still available, right? Keith. Yeah. Um, sorry, no, I know that was bad promotion, though, right? Um, in my new book, right, um, at the base of Dinis Powers Fort, right, um, boats could get to as well with the same material that we actually find at this site and all those other sites that we actually mentioned. So we've got lots of other radiocarbon dates. So from this period, people lived within this landscape. All the way from the 300s and you've got the roman villa um the people living on the roman villa are, are undoubtedly some of the people found at, at this site that that that's that's and and having a <coughs> villa having a monastery having this site proves that people are still um there's a continuity of people living within this landscape um if not from the late iron age all the way through to today for so two thousand years of evidence that's great love it um, they suggest that the burial continued at Landoc until the demise of the monastery 
into the nine or the ten hundreds. And then we've got another question, right? Monastery. Why did monastery go out of use? And I could probably tell you why the monastery went out of use. Because it was forced to by the Normans that were coming into the area. So if you move that date a little bit further on into the 10 hundreds, about 1080 or around there, I asked the question, if we're such a massively religious um, country in, in, in Wales, um, and we've got the period of the saints, where did they all go when the Normans turned up? Because all we've got is the Cistercians, um, Cathusians, we've got the Dominicans, uh, Benedictines, Franciscans and so on. That's all we've got. What happened to all these earlier uh, monastic orders? And probably what happened to these monastic orders, were, um, they probably were all slaughtered and they were buried within these sites because the new Norman Christianity did not equate to the Christianity of our country before the Normans actually got here. Um, oh, that was a bit strong, wasn't it? Flip an egg. So, um, yes, that was very strongly put. So, what I'd like to do after the break, I'll, I'll, I'm going to do, do give, you, give you a quick overview of what we're going to do after the break. We're going to look at Gla um, Glastonbury. Um, we're going to go to Dennis Powers. We're going to have a nice little book, look at Dennis Powers. And then that will um, lead us to the end of where we want to go today. But I've got, what I want to do is tell you a little bit more about Cadbury Castle before we actually get on to Glastonbury, away from this site of Dennis Powers. So, so what I'd like to do is um, I would like to um, ask if there's any questions. Um, again, if anyone's uh, interested in Monday, I've got Jay, um, I've got um, Chris's name down. Anyone else interested in a copy of the book? Um, Jane, anybody else? Let me know. Um, and so, so just get that out of the way. So we'll just um, see if there's any questions, and then we'll have a well-deserved 15-minute break, and everyone else can deal with their phone calls, which I've got phone calls to deal with as well. So um, let's sort of. Um, yes, we, we've stopped the image. So Goff, anything you'd like to say, darling? Big hug. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, no, it was very interesting. Going back to Curlean, you say you think it was built after the legions had left. Yes. So what were the what were the people using it for? Because they were still sort of Roman culture, there wasn't it? Actually, actually, you're saying all the right things. You're asking all the right questions. The same questions I I'm asking as well. Um, now it's very controversial for me to say that it wasn't built by the legionaries but it doesn't make sense for the legionaries to put it so close it, it doesn't make military sense there's no point having those defenses it's it you know okay this is the same thing right ogmore castle ogmore castle is, is a really crap place to build a castle because it's overlooked by a ridge just just don't just beyond right and I, it, you got a castle at ogmore because it, it's <coughs> built by a native lord blah 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 that answers it right so if i'm saying the same asking the same questions with that i'm asking the same questions with the amphitheater what we do know if we look at the evidence with um, verulanium st albans we've got a theater in verulanium st albans that's used all the way to the very end days of the roman world um, in Britain, so they, they, so we've got that. So whatever they, you know, what they use in the amphitheater for is everything that we use these types of sites for. Edicts from emperors. Um, there's an uh, an edict from the emperor Caracalla, for example. We can do the edict now. We, we're, he's, he's in the middle. Let, let's just let's just get the image image on there. Let's just talk briefly about what these sites would have actually been for. Can you imagine? There's there's a rider, um, and that rider's come all the way from. Um, um, I don't know, Londinium, and he stood there in the middle, and he's doing an edict of Caracalla. He's basically, I actually would have come from York, because York was the capital city of the Roman world for, for, for about a year, in the year 12, um, in the year 212, 212, and Caracalla was proclaimed emperor. So the edict of Caracalla would, would be now that um, women have got more rights. Um, also, uh, the edict of Caracalla is everybody is now... Um, a, a, um, an actual citizen of the Roman world. People have given more rights under the Edict of Caracalla. This is where the Edicts of Caracalla would have been read out. Um, there would have been travelling. There would have been travelling circuses. There would have been travelling gladiatorial um, events. There would have been people performing um, poetic works. Um, there would have been all these things going on, and this is what this was used for. Um, and um, maybe there would have been the odd Roman um, legionary um, travelling with his detachment across the country. They would have 
um, sort of done some mock battling and then all sorts of things this site would have actually been used for. Great to get it. Thank you. All the way to the very end days of the Roman world, Goff. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Got and the other, th the other thing as well, Goff, if we got anything to go with the Guildhall excavations in London, we might have actually used it for a marketplace as well. It's perfect for a marketplace. Car yeah. boot sales. Yeah. Car boot sales. Shut up, Keith. Yeah. Um, <laughs> actually. Lentus. <laughs> exactly. No, uh, wagon sales. No, I says, yeah. Oh, back. Oh, 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 scrap, scrap. Do you know these scrap metal merchants that go around? Haven't they realised that nobody knows what the hell they're saying? <laughs> Rao! 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 What? What? What the hell is that? Can you imagine if you're a foreign? If you're a foreign? My God, we're being invaded by idiots! Like Chris. No, you're not an idiot, Chris. I, I didn't mean that. <laughs> Okay. He, no, nothing. Thank you. Very interesting. Okay. What about you, Kith? Uh, Kith? 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 Uh, Latifa? Uh, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, organization. You, you said there are two areas on the amphitheatre that might be untouched or hadn't been dug out previously and you were considering that they may be digging in there or something? Uh, it would be perfect to have our archaeological excavation to prove the fact that we've, we've got some... Um, Early, early medieval evidence. Yeah, I showed you that on the map, that, didn't I? Is that because they have that two areas haven't been dug before? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, that's right. So uh, what I'm going to do is get back to the map again, and we'll uh, if you if you look here, uh, if you look here, that area hasn't been really excavated. And actually, strangely oh. enough, if you look at that ridge, um, most of the area, if you go here, right, all of this is about three meters high of deposition. Some deposition from the river. This is actually full of buildings. None of this has been excavated. So you might think actually leading to the amphitheatre, you might actually get other evidence here as well. So those are the two areas that we're talking about. Yeah, I'm, right, do you know, right. and the other thing as well is, right, the way, the way to go to somewhere like Cadu and the National Museum of Wales uh, with this is to basically say, actually, I'm not interested in going down to the Roman remains. I'm just interested in what's above them. And that would be a selling piece because if you go to the Cadu and say, oh, I want to excavate the Roman site, they say, we've got enough of it. We don't need any more evidence. Yeah. I want the other evidence that's been missed. That's what I'm interested in. Um, so that's answered you, um, Keith. And uh, yeah. Jane? No, very interesting. No questions. Right. Okay. Jane, don't want a book. Um, Arnold! Mate, Arnold, and the other thing as well is, right, Arnold, because we're, this this is um, 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 Goff winding me up when it's reduced, you've still got to send the extra for the book because we've got to post it to you. Yeah, send what, sorry? Oh, but, but, oh, God, it's 14 quid if we're sending it to you, right? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so I just thought I'd let you know. But if you do do that, we'll put some free gifts in there as well. Duck yeah. eggs. Oh. <laughs> so I'd be sending £14 pounds for each book. Right, all right then. If you send fourteen pounds, I'll cover postage. You let you have two quid off. Oh, you got to charge you another two quid for the signing. Right, okay. Um, um, oh, hang on a minute. If they're going to two separate places, no, they got to be fourteen quid each. No, no. That, all right, I, I'm digging myself a hole here, and I shut up, Carl. Right, Jess, anything you want to? Um, anything you? Uh, me, yeah, Cole. Um, well, I don't know whether you might hate me for this. Um, Probably. Um, but is there any evidence of continuous trade? So what I'm saying yes. here is that um, has there been any Roman kilns identified that has evidence of it still being used after uh, the Roman period? Because I can't, I can't see how they they could have these kilns and then be forgotten about after the Romans and not be used. I, what I'm saying is is that part of my dissertation is that I'm arguing that after the post-Roman period, some parts of Roman life was still being used by yes, people. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I think that's something that I'd like to look at, especially the kiln has been identified around the corner from my house. Um, yes. It, it was a lot of planning, they quickly excavated it and that was that. And I look past that house every day and I think I wonder if there was evidence of um, early medieval there because the trade seems to be important and I think Romans 
established quite a lot of good trade and I think it would be a waste if we didn't pick that up and there's obviously trade in the later medieval period that's quite advanced as well so they've got to get it from somewhere I, I actually I actually I actually think the answer is quite simple um, at this time we're starting to see a deterioration into the 400s um, anything that they're producing in these kilns would be of value but obviously before that period um, they're, they're sort of um, you get lots of what's called pottery wasters um, in the medieval period, you can identify kilns by the amount of crap that's been chucked away because it wasn't appropriate to so sell. It's quite possible that the, the evidence for this period is going to be so limited because mm. everything's going to be of value. So, but but there is there is talk of, of, of some kilns in operation. We get poorer qu quality pottery being produced, but obviously they would have they would have continued, but it, it, it got the, the quality got worse and worse. So yeah, yeah. Um, so. So right, uh, Jim. Any right? Actually, Jim, put your questions through Karen because your mic is absolute crap, and it's like listening to a Dalek on speed. Right, Karen. Karen. Hey, Jim. Oh, what is, um, well, you said there's a monastery at Landark. Um, would there not no surviving um, uh, written records produced by the monastery? Right. The 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 uh, the uh, right. If if you want if you want to me if you want me to put this into a um, m most most of what that you've in fact I've already answered the question earlier on I said about um, the monastic orders being wiped out in in Wales Cymru before the um, the Normans got here all their records would have been destroyed even the Landaf charters in Cardiff that are apparently based on earlier documents are actually copies um, it seems that you get Norman stuff surviving but any of our records is being completely wiped out so um, uh, it, it's basically based on what we can find in the archaeology rather than the history. History in regards to what you find in documentary evidence um, regards to the land of charters and the black books and, and all the rest of it. Um, it it's almost as if it, it's, it's not the picture that you want to read because it's not complete. Hopefully that's answered your question. And anything else from you guys before I have my break? Yeah, Carl, Jess was talking about pottery kilns, but is there ever any evidence the lime kiln in Demol by Landwit was in use, you know, right through from Roman period to, you know, right into sort of 18th century and whatnot, or uh, the, 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 19th the, century? The answer is no, 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 and no again. But, but what, what we're going to do, I'm, I'm going to, um, if, if, you, if you look at the little, little sketch on the screen, so yeah. for that's all a lime, lime, right? So the first thing you're going to do is, a, is have a lime kiln down more or less near the face. But then what's going to happen mm. is the face is going to move. So the material from that lime kiln is actually going to be placed into the lime kiln itself. So it keeps moving. Most of the evidence for the lime kilns is only the, the, the last time that lime was being um, okay. produced. So that's, yeah. that's a simple, that's an easy answer. So the answer is no. Okay, thank you. And, and if it's if it's good lime, the answer is definitely no, because mm -hmm. um, you know good lime. W w Lantwit Major is, which I will do on my walk tomorrow um, in the evening. Lantwit Major is the place of lime export. It, it's what Lantwit Major built its 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 livelihood on. Um, mm -hmm. Light Lantwit Major, strangely enough, is probably one of the only places along the south wales coast that does things legitimately everywhere else seems to wreck ships um and do things underhand um Lantwit major is the only honest place um along the south wales coast in history but and, and, until goth landed there Still is. Right. <laughs> so what we're gonna do we're gonna have a break now we'll be back in 15 shuck along dong, dong, bing, bong, dong. see you soon okay Um, no, I said I didn't shut it, so I didn't I didn't lock it, you had to push it on. Okay. Oh, some sort of message about the garage. You can bring me back a kipper if you like. 
Um, just sort of break time.
Are we all ready for my gay abandon? Certainly. Right, I, we're just right. The other thing as well is right. I wanted to know, um, and I can't go into too much detail, but um, uh, we, we've uh, we've acquired an archaeological site, and um, as of uh, it will be set up for um, full blown excavations this time next year. Um, just out of interest, would anyone be interested in coming out on an archaeological excavation for a weekend? You know I would, Carl. Yeah, I know, but Jessica, you're just a creep. Um, Where is it, Carl? Um, it, it's somewhere in Wales. Uh, if we can get there, I mean, North I don't know. North or South? <laughs> south Southwest Wales. You, um, it, it doesn't have a train going to it, but um, we, we could organise transport anyway from um, the nearest town, which would be Carmarthen. Yeah, I would be interested, as long as it's luxury accommodation. Oh, no. What may do? Yeah, I'd be interested too. Oh, you can pick Keith up then. He can shack up with you in a bedroom somewhere. <laughs> That's good. So, uh, I, I wouldn't want Ka I wouldn't want Kathy there because she 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 would just um dominate the situation. So, uh, anyway, um yes. Anyway, uh, I'd just like to say it's um we will have a um I think we'll have a nice little group on Monday on the walk anyway, 11, and it'll be good to see Lynn. And uh, we're expecting a quite a crowd tomorrow night, so that's going to be good. Um, so trying to get things back oh, to normal. I'll come on the walk um, on Monday as well, Carl. Oh, Ka Karen, Karen, it, it, you know, I'm going to have all these babes there. It's a shame, it's a shame Jim's going, actually, to be honest, but, um, it, it's, uh, yeah, we're going to have uh, Lynn, Lynn the babe, Chris. Karen. I'll put on my best frock for you. <laughs> yeah, but, no, I want it back, thank you very much. <laughs> Where is this walk? <coughs> Can I get there on the bus? Um, if you, um, yeah, Al, 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 Algernon was asking this, I think, or someone was asking this. Um, our, one of our members from, oh, by the way, um, <clears throat> One of our members from uh, Bridgend was asking this, who's going to be transferring to uh, Monday morning, um, called Henry, because he lives in Wick. So he, he will be going on, on the bus, I do believe, to Cowbridge. So if you can get the bus to Cowbridge, um, then it's um, a walk from the sound, town centre down the south gate. Um, yeah, it, it, it's doable if you... if. Um, if if you've got somebody um, with a map or something, it's not far away from the town centre at all. And where did you Keith, say? It was just Keith, if you don't mind coming in the car with Lynn and myself, you can have a lift, but you have to wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I can get to the bus station if you want to pick me up from the bus station. Okay, okay. What, what time? Uh, I think half past ten would probably be early enough. Okay, Chris. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be fine. Up, 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 up past ten. It's only twenty minutes away. Yeah. So, have you uh, got Have you got a phone number, Keith? In case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, hang on. Hang on. I, 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 I got to turn the recording off. I, why did? Right, one, two, three. Recording. It's not that you never turned me on, is it? You know, you've always turned me on. Right. Okay. You're permanently turned on, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm just. Uh, you know, so I, I, do they do it in pink for Carl? Yes. Yeah, they got all different sorts of colours. Yes. They they take all sorts. Uh, we'll just do. Go there. We'll, we'll, we'll just do a couple of articles of the week. So, uh, um, fra pottery fragment spells out earliest days of alphabet. Um, as antiques go, a fragment of pottery with with some faded ink letters on it uh, might not normally grab the attention. It should, however, according to archaeologists who say that the partial inscription discovered on a Bronze Age pot shirt in Israel is a missing link in the history of alphabetical writing. Um, the searchers had previously uncovered evidence for the earliest alphabet being developed um, by Kynalite miners in the Sinai Peninsula around nearly 4,000 years ago. It was known to have been used in the Levant about 1,300 years BC, so um, 3,300 years ago. However, a 500-year gap in the records between the earliest examples of Sanyai Ifabat and the first um, securely dated examples in southern Levant has long um, confused archaeologists. But there is the writing. So there you go. Um, 
I'm not going to do. I'm not going to do a massive amount of stuff. Um, more discoveries in ancient Egypt associated with Han- Anamhotep the third, um, and basically a lost golden city. So that they're, they're again they're finding whole cities in Egypt still. And that's not to say that we got two missing Roman cities in uh, Britain still to find as well. Um, and uh, site of Caesar's murder and home to Romans feral cats opens to tourists. Um, yes. Well, here we go. Da, 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 da. The open sunken site the size of a city block can be peered down on from the busy streets that surround it but has not been accessible for about 30 years. It was first excavated in the 1920s by builders planning to put up a block of flats but work was stopped when they found four temples. Um, it could this site obviously they're opening this and you can have a look down at the ruins from uh, from Rome. Um, we're talking about there's a lot about these um, Nigerian Benign busts being uh, sent back now so that's good i'm happy with that um and lo- loads of articles here today just too much um, another one about the benin they're really into this there's quite a lot about the benin bronzes which is absolutely great mosaic used as a coffee table was from caligula's pleasure barge oh now this is good we'll have a bit of this and then we'll get on with the lecture here we go um debauchery there's nothing wrong with that mosaic used there it is okay uh, mosaic used as a coffee table was from Caligula's pleasure bag. But Jessica, didn't you find a mosaic coffee table in um, um, Exeter when you went down? Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, we did. Me and Bill. Yes, that could be it. And I heard the language was about really bad when yeah um, when I told you to go and find it. For centuries, it lay in the mud. With us as well. What's that? I think Kathy went with us as well. Oh, we were geez. looking for that Roman wall and we found that mosaic. She, yes. I bet you she, she, she breathed fire on that one. Um, it lay in the mud on the bed of a volcanic lake in Italy before being dredged up in an operation ordered by the great Mussolini and then illegally exported to the United States where it ended up being used for decades as a coffee table in a Manhattan flat. <laughs> <laughs> After a distinctly chuckered history, a multicoloured mosaic that adorned a vast pleasure barge built for the despotic Emperor Caligula um, 2,000 years ago finally returned home yesterday. The intricate mosaic, which would have been walked upon by the Emperor himself during lavish parties, was having a bit of... Or- he had an orgy on top of it, apparently, to this um, article, on board the vessel. Um, it's it's fundamental to bring archaeological artifacts like this back to their original context. I'm very happy that it has finally been restored to where it came from. The mosaic decorated the barge, uh, one of the barges, because there was two of them. After, after, and we know this, after the barges were recovered during the um, era of Mussolini, they were kept in a museum on the shores of the lake. In 1944, as the Allies pushed north, the uh, museum was set um, on fire uh, with suspicions that retreating Germans forced uh, forces torched it, and, and there's obviously that still that case to um, get compensation for the Germans for destroying their boat. Um, so this this has survived, and there was a photograph taken of it in 1955, but it disappeared without trace. But now it's been found. It was recovered in 19. It was recovered in uh, 2017, after which experts spent years removing the teeth. Tea and coffee stains. <laughs> I thought that was funny. I thought that was hilarious. Um, it, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be any good if I didn't have a good old laugh. Right, yeah. let's get back to this. A laugh. Do you know what you can tell him from Barry Can you like, you know, down, yeah. down, down the pack. Bit of a right. giraffe. Do you a bit of a giraffe in a pack? Do you think I'd be good in London, sounding like this, like you know? You sound a bit scouse to me. Yeah, I do. Uh, right, okay, shut up, you. Um, right. So back to where we were. Uh, we, if if there's if there's a little phone call as a little bit of an interlude, I've got to get it. But I'm only going to be on line for a couple of uh, minutes or so. So anyway, so back to this. So um, we what we then moved from the stuff at Dennis, um, stuff at Landock, and then we moved nicely on to um, th- this site. Uh, this is the reconstruction of those buildings that would have been on the top of Glastonbury Tor. It look it doesn't look very fen like like and very flooded at the top of Glastonbury Tor, so that that's a bad representation. But we've got evidence of these early medieval buildings on the top of the tor. 
Um, and the tour itself is now dominated by St. Michael's Tower. So there's the tour. You can actually see Glastonbury Tour from the coastline of Lantwick Major even to this day. Um, and naturally, back in the day as well, back in the Roman period, for example, most of the landscape around the tour would have been completely flooded. And, and um, 700 years BC, uh, what you do see is this is actually the coastline 700 years BC. In fact, it's not the coastline. The coastline is here. So over about um, over about 800 years, big chunks of the um, landscape was sort of reclaimed. It became marshes and some um, farmland and so on. But the fact of the matter is that landscape is still continually flooded. For example, um, at Glastonbury um, in 2005, you can remember all those pictures of the campsite being completely flooded. That's because um, it's in the floodplain. So anyway, back to where we were, uh, back to where we were. There is Glastonbury Tour. Now we're taking it of the view from um, Glastonbury, which is all the way down here. So if you're at the tower and you're looking back, you can see the remains of the abbey. You can see the remains of Glastonbury Town itself. Um, and what I was trying to say earlier on from Cadbury, Cadbury, um, it, it, we saw Cadbury earlier on and, it, and around it, it's sort of, uh, surrounded by nice green fields but Glastonbury unfortunately has this big um, town uh, which it's on um, the Glastonbury tour overlooks now all these all this terrace in here um, it was long believed that Glastonbury tour was actually man-made but no it's actually a big geological outrock of carboniferous rock and um, there are actually um, I there's actually ironstone there as well. So what we do find in regards to uh, the red well, um, not the chalice well. I think that's the right way around. There's the white well and the red well. There there's one there's one well that um, spurs out down well lane in Glastonbury, and that actually spurs out red water because it's actually bleeding out the ironstone. So this is a big. This is absolutely a, a massive outcrop. Of stone, and as I, as predicted, that phone calls quickly come in, so I'm going to be very rude, and I'm going to get this quickly. Hang on. Hello, hiya. Everything okay? What's that? Yeah, I'm teaching. I'm teaching. Yes. Is everything okay? No, I just jumped off the phone to say hello, but everything's okay. Just look at me walking back. Hooray! So back to where we were. So this this is not man-made. It's a natural geological um, outcrop. It's a natural island. It's a it's a bit like when this was actually surrounded by island. It's a bit like what what Than, you know you got Thanet Island and you got the Isle of Dogs. All of those being islands at one stage. Um, and again with land being um, sort of um, uh, the weird thing is the, the the water level has has gradually risen over those um, hundreds of years. But what in with that, um, the landscape is being clogged up with um, silts and, and so on. So eventually this land has been reclaimed. Uh, but the, the one thing that one thing when you're in Glastonbury, the point I'm trying to make when you're in Glastonbury, there's like a very spiritual take to it. And you, you've got a little bit of a view where it looks like there's nothing around it. But there in the distance is, in fact, Glastonbury town itself. Um, one one thing the, the whole point of mentioning Glastonbury to, to, today and we've done it in the past is that Glastonbury itself is massively steeped with legends associated with King Arthur and that's a shame for people who actually want to find facts and really um, firm information um, dating to that period of the early medieval what what we do know associated with um, what we do know associated with the excavations at the Abbey um, is that they they found bucket loads of Roman pottery, um, and then what they find is then after that they do actually find, um, which is this. 
in excavating <coughs> the area of the abbey complex, which is down from the, uh, the tour itself, they found um, evidence of Roman <coughs> amphora. So again, Glastonbury itself, linked with the other evidence at Landoc, linked uh, with Tintagel, linked with Dinis Powers, linked with Cadbury Castle. There's all this data, all this information associated uh, with that period into the 400s. So there's a lot of evidence. The problem, again, back that very point I was trying to make, and I'm making, that, that when this, this whole thing about Glastonbury and early medieval evidence lost because of the King Arthur uh, myth and legend, steeped, uh, steeped in all those myths and legends uh, associated with modern day Glastonbury. But if you actually scratch under the surface, what they've started doing, and I, I remember I mentioned this a few months ago, what they started doing in Glastonbury, they've started publishing the archaeological excavation reports associated with Glastonbury, and they're finding so much information to paint a picture of this Dark Ages being very light, being full of occupation, um, full of things that are happening. And again, if you want to go with the um, legends and myths of, of King Arthur, you can think that this would have been an ideal place um, for a king to have actually surveyed his domain. Uh, but the strange thing is, um, if this king would have been um, surveying his domain, he would have been surveying a marshy quagmire. That is, in fact, the Somerset Levels. Um, that was was only starting to be reclaimed at this period in time. Again, having this um, link to do with early Christianity on the top of um, Glastonbury Tor as well. Um, and again, the, the monastery itself down from this as well in Glastonbury Town itself. Uh, that being steeped in early origins of Christianity, going into uh, being a monastery, then being overtaken by the Norman monastic orders, going then into the period when people are actually really starting to think and believe the likes of King Arthur. By the way, somebody, what the hell is that? I'm going to have to meet somebody. What was that? Oh, who was that? Who was that being very naughty? I don't know. There was feedback from you, Carl. I don't know if it was... No, no, I didn't even... Pre no, it was somebody else. Yeah, you, you were sort of echoing. Oh, yeah, no, it was coming from me. So what happened? Somebody put their mic on, as they're doing now. Uh, again, yeah. Yeah. Somebody's putting their mic on, and I'm echoing back. Right, okay. That's just thrown me a bit. Anyway, carrying on. Um, so again, um, what I would then like to do is link this site to Dennis Powers and, and everything else that we've looked at today. The, the stuff at Landoc and, and all that wonderful information. So then we actually go to this site at Dennis Powers. But I did say actually before the break, I wanted to mention um, the site of Cadbury Castle again. Um, Cadbury um, Hill Castle. Because... When when they were looking at um, Cadbury Hill Castle, um, when they when they were excavating there in 1968 and 1973, <coughs> they they started coming across very similar stuff to what we find at Dinis Powers. So, for example, I quote: "The hill fort was refortified. Dinis Powers was fortified for the first time in the 400s." Now, Cadbury Hill Castle was refortified in the 400s again. Occupation extended um, way into the 500s, um, from which much imported pottery has been recovered. Exactly the same stuff that we get at Dinis Powers. A religious site may have been associated with um, Cadbury um, um, Hill Castle. Um, which we haven't got similarly to Dennis Powers, but if we got the site at Landock down the road, then that's a similar bit of evidence. What we've also got at the Cadbury Hill Castle site as well, um, they found evidence of, um, here we go, nearly 800 fragments of pottery, all from the Mediterranean, again into the floor 500, so um, the Cadbury Hill Castle site is 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 trading probably with the same people that are trading associate, association with Dennis Powers. And what about this one? Jessica asked me the question earlier on about, you know, what, what skills did people have at this time and whether pottery kilns and, and, and things were still active. One type of industry that probably had completely collapsed by the 400s 
um, was the manufacture of glass. So one thing that we're looking at into the 4 500s is the import of glass. And what we've got is evidence of up to 48 glass vessels being excavated at Cadbury Hill um, Castle in Somerset. And you know what? Some of that glass is also being found at Dennis Powers. So I wanted I wanted to do that little bit before we actually go on to the Dennis Powers site and we end with the Dennis Powers site. So there we go again. Uh, this is the words of Leslie Alcock who actually excavated there in the 1950s. We interpret Dennis Powers as the sleece or court of a local ruler. So into the 400s with its naiad or hall surrounded by subsidiary buildings uh, of stone and timber and forming the centre of a variety of agriculture, industrial, domestic pursuits. Very similar to what we could say is obviously going on at Cadbury Castle as well. Now this is a site at Dennis Powers and I know some of you have actually been to this site with me. Um, it, it's an absolutely fascinating site. If, if I showed you an aerial photography uh, photograph of it, you can't actually see the site because it's um, surrounded in trees. Um, but one, one thing um, is that I've, I've got some nice little notes on this um, and I'm going to give that a go and I'm going to see if I can um, look at that and, and read them out. So back, back to this site. Now, all the archaeologists up until 1950s said that this site was Iron Age. They said it, it definitely Iron Age because it's got the banks and ditches. But as Leslie Alcock said, there's something wrong about this site. It, 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 it's not as big as the usual hill forts. It's in fact quite a small site. Um, so when he started excavating, he started realizing that the pottery was sort of, um, the, the Iron Age pottery was not really associated with the banks and ditches. In fact, the, the Iron Age pottery was almost, um, was almost in the banks, had almost been churned up to create the banks. So he thought that's strange. So that, that obviously means that the banks and ditches that you can actually see on this plan uh, are actually um, from a later period. What we do find is the site at Dennis Powers, you've got some unusual sets of banks and ditches there in the south there. What is unusual at Dennis Powers is that you've got the Iron Age and they've not got a defended site. There's no banks and ditches really. They don't need them because it's um, surrounded by water like like um, Glastonbury Tall, they don't need banks and ditches. So it's an Iron Age site. You can bring goods in from, from the sea and, and from around the landscape. It's good. You've got a nice safe site. Everybody's happy. Whoever lived there was probably some kind of a local leader in the Iron Age. And what may have happened is as the Roman period started to occur, this local leader thought, hang on a minute, right? I want a bit of that. I want a bit of Rome. And strangely enough, the people living at the site ceased to live there. They ceased to live at Dinner's Powers. Where did they go? I believe that they went to the Landoc site, the Landoc Roman Villa site. And I believe that the original people who lived in, year, in the Iron Age, some of the descendants are actually buried north of Landoc Church. I can't prove that, but it's unusual that as the Roman period comes in, the site at Dinner's Powers is abandoned. And then this is what happens next. In the 400s, just like at Cadbury, just like at Tintagel, this site is reoccupied. We, what we do see at Glastonbury, for example, we've got Roman evidence and, and so on, but that's further on down, that, that's sort of in the town. So this site is actually reoccupied and they actually build banks and ditches the ones that you can actually see north of that plan. So Les Leslie Alcock was actually right to question the archaeology. The hill fort, in an, if you think in an Iron Age context, obviously the banks and ditches from a later period, Dinis comes from the word city um, in, for the Welsh speaking people of Dinis Powys. Um, and the one the one thing the one thing about um the name itself is probably the reason why the neighboring village was named Dinis Powys. An archaeologist excavating the site in the nineteen hundreds decided to rename the hill fort after the settlement. It was known as Kurtur Ashla 
Hill Fort, which is a bit of a mouthful. So they called it Dinis Powys. Now, whether it, whether it's the Dinis of a, of a great leader or a great king, um, it's it's rather difficult to work out what's going on. But it's definitely a really really important site. It's one of the most important sites from the early medieval period alongside Landoc in the entire area. And guess what it's got in common with um, Glastonbury Tor? It's the site that you're looking at is also a Carboniferous Limestone outcrop. It's, it's really intriguing that the two major sites in this period are both associated with Carboniferous Limestone outcrops because they stand out. Good drainage. You can put a site on there and both sites have access from the sea. So what I don't want to do is sort of um, look at the earlier stuff. But this early medieval period, the, the, the excavators referred to the early Christian period. Well, I'm not really sure about that because you've got Christianity in Britain for a few years before that. And what we see is, is if we go to another bit of a plan on there, and if I move these two alongside each other, hang on a minute, hang on, I'm just trying to get my notes to work alongside, hang on, hang on, work. Sometimes you've got to you've got to be nice to your computer. So that is where the buildings are in the top bit, where you can actually see the cursor. And actually, another bit of a plan there it is. So if we if we sort of move that, uh, that won't work. So that there is actually the buildings that they excavated. Um, and there's lots of post holes. There's a lot more than this, but this is the earliest phase of these buildings. Now this is really important. So they 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 look roughly built buildings. But they've got gullies, they, they, there's hearths associated with them, uh, there's postals, and there's these impressive banks and ditches. I'll tell you how impressive these banks and ditches are. Look at that. That that's look how deep these, these banks and ditches are going into the site. So they these people really knew what they were doing. And other other banks and ditches were actually added to this site as well. If we actually go back to the original plan, there's lots more banks and ditches. So the first stage itself is actually this and then later on more banks and ditches are actually added so if we if we start to look at this site so he was very surprised to actually find find this archaeological evidence he was very very surprised indeed um and so archaeologists interpret these buildings um that, that, that uh, if we go back here again they interpret that as a hall associated with some kind of leader um, and it's constructed over about four four phases. It's associated with a very powerful family, one family. Now, one bit of archaeological evidence which I would love to get my hands on, and this is a really crude term. Among the excavations, the excavators found the burial of a human child, approximately five years old, which they believe dates to this period. And the reason why this set of human remains would be crucial is that they could they could um, analyze the DNA of this human child with the DNA that's been excavated at Landoc at the site north of the church. And also we might be able to look at the child's DNA with the with the set of human remains that were actually excavated associated with the Landoc Roman villa. Now, Leslie Alcock is, is mentioning about this sort of Christian period burial. Um, and the, also, this is, this is a major thing as well. There was also much refuge produced in the early medieval period, leading to the deposits of rubbish. Several large rubbish pits, middens, along the eastern edge of the site. The sheer volume of this rubbish led uh, Leslie Olcock to state in 1963 that it was the largest assemblage of early Christian material so far recovered in Wales and the marches. In fact, so much pottery uh, was excavated, they, they had to leave big chunks of it behind. So before we actually before we actually finish with my, with my notes here today, um, that's um, that's the. If you look at the cursor and we sort of draw a little bit into this and get get onto that bit there. 
uh, drawing. That's Dennis Powers Castle. This is the Hill Fort. Uh, this is a modern sort of an, an old Dennis Powers town. Um, and what there is, we've this valley all the way along here gets flooded. <coughs> this valley gets very flooded even today. And if anyone's ever lived in Dennis Powers or knows that anyone living in Dennis Powers, there is massive flooding in, um, in Dennis Powers today. Um, what we do know and what I know uh, in particularly is that if you the water itself that that's Barry there so the water this landscape was basically flooded all the way through at high water levels in the winter um, even water sort of at very high water mark completely surrounded all the environs of this site making it an island but that would have been in the Roman period it, it doesn't get that badly flooded today but bits of Dennis power still do And again, that sort of deep climb. And again, excavations dating um, back to the 1950s. I'm sure that that girl there's actually got pigtails. Quite quite, quite interesting. Um, so what I'm going to do is, uh, well, I'll read a little bit more information and then we'll call it a day. This is, this, is, this is Alcock's own words from 1963. To judge from the archaeological material which has been recovered, the main basis of the Dennis Powers economy in the early medieval was stock raising. He called it the early Christian period. Primary, um, primary of cattle and sheep. Unusually for the area, however, it appears from the excavated annual bone that most of the livestock was slaughtered before they were capable of reproduction. Something indicating that with the exception of the pigs, the number of livestock would not be sustainable unless new imports were regularly um, brought in from elsewhere. So in other words, these people live the high life. They were able to slaughter animals before they were able to reproduce. That means they're involved um, in, in advanced trade. Um, as well as eating such meat, the inhabitants of Dennis Powers Hillfort apparently ate bread as rotary quern, querns used for grinding grain, uh, likely locally grown, were found at the site. A subsidiary role in the Dennis Powers economy was played by metalworking. That's another thing that we have with some of these other sites, metalworking evidence. And it was the uh, produce from both the livestock and metalworking that the elite, whoever these people were, traded in order to gain access to luxury goods, such as wine carried in amphora, oil in amphora from the continent, pottery from the Mediterranean at glass, from as far away as Syria, and faience beads from ancient the land of ancient Egypt, but this is now the uh, the period of the four and the five hundreds. There's also evidence that these people may have traded with people in Ireland as well. But that's all we'll say about that, because that might have a link with the royal house of Brycheinog and the princess at Langorse Cranog, which also dates from a period that's a few years after this, but not so far off. And on that note, and on that final missive, that's me done for today. So, um, again, if anyone wants to go to this site, it's best to go there in the summer months because uh, there's um, the, the Valley of, of St. George here and you actually go up and there's some little steps that go up um, and you go into this site and you pass these banks and ditches, but we're not exactly sure what these are. Um, and then you head through all the uh, bushes and all the rest of it and then eventually you get to these really steep banks and ditches. An outer scarp, ditch, um, middle bank, um, there's a bit of a ditch, another bank, another bit of a ditch, and the inner scarp here. So this was a multi valet early medieval defended enclosure, or call it a hill fort. So anyway, let's call it a day. Are there any questions on any of this? Goff? No, it's very interesting. Lots of new information there. Thanks it's, very much. It's local as well, so that's good. So um, thanks for that, um, Goff. I, again, I love your top. It's wonderful. Um, I wonder if um, Chris is wearing a nice dress that I can wear on Monday. Bring it along, Chris. Um, any, any questions? No, no, thanks, Carl. Very interesting. Right. Um, Algernon, uh, what about you? Am I Algernon? No, he's Algernon. Chris is Algernon. Algernon. Go on, then. So it's uh, Arnold. 
No, he's Arnold, but no, nobody cares about his name. It begins with an A. I, I, he can't unmute himself. Anyway, Keith, what about you? Go on, Algernon. Give it, give it, give it your best. I'm Arnold. Look, just tell us what you want to bloody say, you numpty. I didn't want to say anything. I just thought it was very nice. And keep up the good work. Oh, cheers, babe. Cheers, babe. Uh, he, at that, I might sign both books. Right, Keith. Uh, can you go back to that picture of the hill fort again, the aerial view? Which one? The aerial view of um, Dennis Paris. Right, okay. I, I, I'll do that for you um, because, you know, me. just for you. There's I no would do anything for love if you won't. Yeah, that, one that one. Right. Is there any evidence of settlement apart from uh, the hill fort there? I mean, you've got a great big, in the center of the photograph, you've got a great big empty green swath haven't you is that, that's there any there? now that's a golf course i can tell you exactly where everything is because um hang on a minute i've just got to get my my cursor on you um here we go and bingo that over there is actually um, a scheduled ancient monument and there's a big um, uh, um iron age uh, then later roman settlement there and the, the aerial photographs of that site are wonderful. Right. So I just wondered if there's obviously a hill fort there, then normally there'd be something around it of the actual everyday peasants. That That's right. So where you've got the green arrows, and about a mile north of here, you've actually got the, um, the hill fort at Cairo. Right, right, right. Okay, fine. And, so this is... next, ne and next week's subject, sorry. Uh, just one last thing. It's just a small site to have much of a settlement, so they're obviously wanting to keep themselves protected and all the rest of it with the water around it. Next next week is actually, um, we're doing the Kyrenian ship. All right, okay. Off the coast of Cyprus, so we're doing that. So, right, uh, what else? Who else have we got? Um, Jane, glorious Jane. No, no questions. Very interesting. I'd like to do a bit of local history. Uh, good, 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 good. Kyrenian. Go Come on. I'm going to go now because I've got an Asda delivery coming. <laughs> All right, then. See you soon, Janie, babes. Bye. Um, uh, Bye. To you, Jessica. Uh, no, not Jessica, Jane. Uh, Jessica, you do your bit and I'll do the rebel. The um, no, you've uh, inspired me, quite frankly, with uh, my dissertation research. So thank you very much for that, Carl. What we'll have to do is take you... You can be part on, of this thing that I might... I've, I've got to try and work out what we're doing with the National Museum of Wales. Gonna, so yeah. I, I've got an idea. Um, right, so Jessica, you stay on at the end. And um, what I'm going to do is Karen, um, Numpty and um, Kathy. Anything you want to say? Whilst I gnaw no, on Karen a banana. Karen and Kathy have no comment. Yeah. Well, now you've muted him as he's about to say something. That's a wise idea. Jim yeah. has no comment no either. Comment. I mean, All right. Okay, then, Jim. I'll bring your eggs for tomorrow, right? Um, make sure you're there at 7 o'clock. And I, and don't stand around talking because I'm, in, I'm working. Right. Um, uh, take your eggs and bugger off. Um, on that note... If there's nobody else wanting to say anything else, you can stay behind and have a chat afterwards if you want. Uh, but if not, I will see you all next week. Looking forward to it. And um, Goff, we, we love you lots. And you, Chris. Um, Arnold, well, love you lots. And Keith and um, maybe Jim a bit. Um, definitely in love with Kathy, as we all are. And uh, Karen. Take care, guys. Bye. Uh, bye. See you, see you Algernon. Bye. Bye. We, we we love Algernon. He's he's great. He's he's Algernon's like a cuddly bear. You know you know you know Mr. Ben. He reminds me of Mr. Ben. Mr. Ben, the Mr. one that ben. dresses up. Yeah, I can see Algernon dressing up in all these like fezzes and, and stuff. You're a bit like Mr. Ben, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> well, what, what? You're an archaeologist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not an actor. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm at all. Shut up, you numpty. Algernon wants to say something. Go on, Arnold. I'll send that money through for the books, and I'll send you an email with the address for the second one to be sent to. Now, the one, the one thing I was, no, I was joking about um, um, signatures, right? Yeah. The, pro the problem is, if I sign all the bloody books, right, a signature is going to be meaningless, right? So what I'm going to say, if you want the one signed to Kent, I'll do that. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, it, it's like too many. If you'd sign too many books, then whatever. It's your choice. Put that on the email. Yeah, I only just want that one sign. It's just it's a bit standing law, so it's a bit of a, uh, well, not a joke, but it was a. 
Yeah. yeah, that's okay. We'll we'll we'll, 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 we'll uh, actually is it? Do you want me actually? Um, do you want me to send him a a, a little gift as well? Oh no, not the gifts. Yeah, yeah. Don't do. <laughs> Yeah, we 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 got we, yeah. I'll, if you want me to, I'll, I'll put a little loud uh, thing in there as well. I sold it to him on the on the basis that um, there'd be very few other people in uh, where he lives or anywhere in Kent that will have that book. So it'd be unique. It will be unique. It will be unique. Yeah, because, yeah it will be. It will be. Okay then. Okay then. Um, Algernon, I'll, I'll um, text you on that. Yeah. Okay. You get in touch with that, and I'll speak to you soon. Yep, well, there you go. See you there. Mind how you go. Thanks for everything. And um, if if I don't see you on Monday, um, we'll see you on Thursday. Okay. Take care. See you there. Bye. Yes, bye. 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 And uh, just just one quick thing because I've actually got a I've got I've got a dash um quite more or less pronto. But um, do you want to uh, quickly stop recording? Or, or, or oh yes, God, I got to stop recording. Yeah, anyway, thanks, thanks, thanks everybody watching this. Um, classified information given out now on, on three, two, one.